One of the most devastating things that a parent can ever go through is to find out that your child is sick. And especially with something that people don't fully understand, uh, maybe a disease that needs to be looked at, uh, something that uh, much research needs to be done on. And I, I can tell you, not with experience, because I'm not a parent and many of you know that, but dealing with the subject on TV all the time, uh, that one sees complete devastation when we deal with parents that have these cases with their children. Some parents tend to crumble in and feel that the world is collapsing on them. Others decide to go out and make a change through research and getting involved with the illness of their child. Shama Sheikh is here and she's going to talk to me about the challenges and the research she's come up with a young boy, Ayan. Welcome back. So we're talking to Shama Sheikh and she's talking about a young boy, Ayan, I think he's six months old, and he's got some challenges from an immune deficiency point of view. We're going to find out more about that. Shama, welcome to the show. Thank you, Faisal. Shama, thank you for contacting the show. Uh, when I looked at your, your case study, uh, I realized that your story uh, has some challenges in it and uh, there's some inspiration in it. And, and I like doing stories where I deal with optimists that get out of, out of bed every morning and decide that although a ton of bricks is standing by, we can actually go and take that ton of bricks, push it out of the way, face those challenges, and inspire other people mm -hmm. to face their challenges. But let's look at the story of baby Ayan. Uh, six months old, uh, you found out mm. in a very strange way that he's very ill. Yes. Tell us a bit about that. Look, the Ayan was born after 11 years. Uh, so, you know, naturally I was really looking forward to having a new baby, nursing him and smothering him and things. And, you know, you read up, you follow up for months on end leading up to the birth. Um, and you you really look forward to welcoming this this new baby on um, in your home and into your lives and you know if anything that I learned from my entire experience is that life is totally totally unexpected um, you know I brought him home we were released from hospital he was completely healthy um, so, so there was no pre-warning that something nothing, is wrong at that stage? Nothing. There was absolutely nothing wrong. But don't doctors do tests nowadays that actually determine these they things don't. at birth? Um, what I found, uh, this is now in hindsight, six months later, um, I found that in South Africa, we don't have uh, screening tests for newborns to determine whether they have any underlying um, ailments yeah. or conditions. Um, I found this out because of engaging with other people on, on the net and through social media, and um, but I'll get to that point later. So briefly what happened, he, um, d he just became ill in the first week that we were home. Um, and the doctors but, weren't... But, but when you say ill, uh, now many young infants have become ill. Yes. And that could be a flu, a cold, or anything like that. How did you discern that this was something different to the normal illness that a, an infant might have? The first irregularity, I'll call it, that I found was that he had a yellow tinge on his eye. So the, th there's, a, there's a link between a yellow tinge in the eye and jaundice, yes. exactly. So there's a link between jaundice and having a yellowish tinge in the eye. And then also it's associated with lethargy when they um, don't latch and they don't drink well. So the first pointer was when your child is born, a few days uh, down the line, you take them. It's actually a week later that you take them to um, a clinic and they get weighed in. The first warning sign that I received was that he didn't regain his birth weight. Um, he became. Was that a big concern at that point, or it wasn't, were you um, just 
thinking it, it, it will sort of sort itself I out. I also thought that it would sort itself out. Um, he wasn't too far off. He was like 0.25 off the mark. So I didn't think that it was anything to worry about. We left the clinic and I continued with his symptoms getting worse. So when I went in a few days later for my postpartum checkup. Um, I decided to pop by the PATHCARE uh, offices and I asked them to please do me a favor and do a TSB on this child. So a TSB is a test that they do for checking for jaundice in infants. And I did this all now on my own initiative. Nobody told me about it and people say, oh, mother's instincts. But you know, we all have a head on our shoulders and you can't just sit back and, because for me, I've had a child before and this was not normal. Um, so I took him in, he had the test and I got a, a call now, this was the third phone call from a pediatrician, that there was nothing out of the ordinary uh, with these results, um, that I should just continue giving him medication for colic and the symptoms would subside. The following week, this is now the second week that we're home, this child became, it was just, nothing that I experienced before. Um, completely lethargic, completely um, uh, not sleeping through the night, uh, extremely uncomfortable, unsettled, and I never slept for three days uh, on end. So the following Friday, I called the pediatrician, this is now the fourth or fifth time I'm on the phone with him, and I said, look, I've been calling all, uh, all week, and I'm really tired now, I actually need to see someone. So they said the woman that I was seeing uh, previously um, was on leave. I said, well, whoever is there, I'm prepared to see them. And that is what I did. I insisted on an appointment. I took him in. And again, they did a clinical checkup of him. And they said, clinically, he looks fine. Absolutely nothing wrong with him. But if what I'm saying is um, has any merit to it, then they need to dig deeper and see uh, what's the underlying because cause of it. In my understanding, two things are happening. One is that um, uh, they are examining him from a clinical point of view. Mm -hmm. And that's now. But you go home with a child. It's a two-week-old baby. Yeah. You're sitting at night with a child, and you're seeing a different set of things happening. Yes. Yeah. He's a two week old baby, you must understand. I, and I could understand where they're coming from with this. We don't have any tests in this country to check underlying problems that infants may have. And um, they just thought, I mean, I put it down to them thinking that I wasn't coping for the first two weeks that I was home. And it wasn't that at all. Um, I mean, I found that he was completely unsettled, um, crying all the time. He wasn't latching. He just became lethargic while he was drinking. He would just scream as though he was in agony, kept pulling his legs up to his stomach and like he was in a lot of discomfort in that area. I've seen children that had colic. I'm not saying that it was an unreasonable assumption that they made, but I've seen children that had colic. And all the counseling that they were giving me was taking place over the phone, and this is why I insisted I need to see someone because somebody needs to take a look at him. There's something not right with him. So, so, so all of that happens in the clinic, and uh, and and it happens on the phone. Mm -hmm. When did you realize, and when did they realize? Hey, you know what? Something is wrong. You know, it was the 18th of March. I will never ever forget that date. Um, I took him in, um, they weighed him, and again, the weight was a concern. So he wasn't gaining as much weight as he should have. Um, and the pediatrician imme immediately said to me, you know, unfortunately, he can't tell that there's anything wrong with him because clinically he looks fine. What he is concerned is that um, he's underweight and he, appears to, um, to to have some sort of discomfort, but at the moment when he examined him, he looked, he looked fine. So he said what he would suggest is that we take him back to the lab, have him, um, he gave me a urine bag that he fitted onto him, and he explained if the urine bag turns any of these colors on the stick, then you need to, um, bring him in immediately because it would be a sign of infection. 
He also did a blood test on him to check for any underlying infections. And he said, look, I'm not really worried about it. He's two weeks old. It's probably something, but let's just be uh, careful and check for it anyway. You know, I barely reached the house with the child. And I got a phone call back from the pediatrician. And he said to me that you need to bring Ayan in immediately. Um, I'm actually quite surprised. He says he's got an immune, he's got a, um, his blood test came back and it shows that he's got an infection and it's quite high. And I promise you, I took him home that day. Uh, sorry, I took him to the hospital that evening and we never left. And that was the first of a, the first painful part of an extremely long journey. So, so is this where it really set in? Uh, and, and did you then have a clear message in your mind to say that something is drastically wrong? I honestly, at that point, it was a long weekend and I never expected to spend more than the long weekend in hospital with him. I assumed that we would be um, going home after the, the long weekend but it never happened like that. Um, over the course of the weekend, uh, they continued to do uh, tests on him. So in the first day that he was there, they drew blood from him, they put a drip up on him, and they did a lumbar puncture on him. And he's two weeks old. You can imagine the trauma that I had to experience as a mother, just sitting down the hall, listening to this child screaming while they did that procedure. Are you him. feeling it? You're feeling yes. it with him. And I couldn't yeah. understand at the time why it was so necessary, because for me that was so drastic. But compared, uh, according to what they said, um, it was necessary because how it works is that babies are quite tiny. And in a small person, you can't pinpoint infections. You've got to do a series of tests to figure out what the point of infection was. So that's what they did for the entire weekend that they were there. They continued to poke and prod him. They did blood tests. They did x-rays, scans, ultrasounds. Shama, I'm going to take you one step forward. Mm. So the determination is made. Mm. Uh, there's an immune problem. No, it wasn't made then. Um, what had happened, um, they couldn't find anything definitive on the, on the blood tests that they did. The only thing that they found was that his infection levels were climbing as opposed to com it coming down. And you must remember, a child that has got a severe um, infection, a newborn especially, they're too small to treat with oral antibiotics, so they give them antibiotics through um, IV. They put him, they changed antibiotics three times over the weekend and his infection levels tripled. He was on the highest dose of antibiotics and nothing worked. When his infection levels tripled, they realized that they had to take uh, further steps and they called in a professor. So the professor had a look at him on the first day that he saw him, which was the Sunday. Um, he looked at the x-rays that they did and all they could say was that it was abnormal. They couldn't really say what was abnormal about it, uh, but they needed to do further tests, they said. So on it went. Um, the professor suddenly came back on Tuesday morning because I didn't hear from him over Monday, which was the long weekend, the end of the long weekend. So I thought no news is good news. Um, but he came back. I was very surprised to see him back on Tuesday morning. And he said that um, he saw his blood test results. He was quite shocked because the infection levels are almost four times what it was when he was admitted. And that's not natural because he should be showing some sort of improvement. So, so in effect, there's no response to the medication Absolutely at all? No response to the medication. So he prodded his tummy again. And the minute he did that, immediately, this child just pulled his legs up and he was extremely uncomfortable. How were you feeling at the time? Uh, as a mother, sitting in the hallway, seeing it all happen, listening to the cries, uh, understanding that this appears to be going downhill. What was your thoughts at the time? You know, um, there's a whole lot of thoughts that race through your mind uh, at that time. Um, you know, I was almost afraid to think because I felt that every time I thought something, 
something worse happened afterwards and I was actually scared to think or preempt anything. Um, it you know, was helplessness must have dawned on you. Completely. You feel totally helpless because you, you almost want to take on that burden and that pain from your child on yourself, but you know that's not possible. All you can do is just comfort him where you can and um, that was also becoming limited at that point because they, they stopped me from picking him up and they also stopped me from, from breastfeeding, um, which is traumatic for a mother to go through because you, th that is how you bond with your newborn and I wasn't able to do that. Um, I can only imagine the, the challenges with all of that. Shoma, tell us, are we talking about um, the diagnosis, the point of yes. the diagnosis? When was that established? Look, I, I will skip through the next uh, few uh, few weeks because I can tell you while he was there at hospital, he had uh, a lumbar puncture done. He had several x-rays, copious blood tests. The file was this thick with all the blood tests that they did. He had um, an exploratory operation on the fourth day of admission. On the fourth day of admission, this is where the nightmare began. When he had that operation, there were two professors that were brought in to, um, to do this exploratory op. They didn't know what they were looking for. They just knew that there was something going on in his abdomen area, um, but they needed to do, be more invasive in order to figure out what was wrong. So when they opened him up, the, the, the professor comes in after the operation an hour and a half, and a half later, and he says to me, we found the problem, there was multiple abscesses on his liver. I almost fell backwards. I couldn't believe it because you just think he's two weeks old. How the hell can something like this happen? Um, you know, I wasn't really interested in the diagnosis at that point. All I wanted to know was, is it treatable? Because for me, it was so drastic. So you were focusing on the treatment. that there was no point in lingering on what you should say. No. It's all about getting to action I just to solve to the problem. Exactly. I just wanted to know, is it treatable? And they said, absolutely. They were going to change these antibiotics. They suspected. But, uh, but now they're referring to the manifestation of the actual problem. So they, yes. and that that's what those little tumors or whatever they might have found. Abscesses. Yes. So so they're referring to the treatment of that specifically, but we still haven't determined the fact that yes. there's an underlying cause that is that's causing yeah. and precipitating this. He was in that hospital for another two weeks after this operation. Following that, he had three procedures done, three theatre pr procedures to have lines inserted up his arm, his tiny arm. He had ports put in to uh, because they ran out of veins to poke him. He had absolutely no spot left on his body. Even his scalp had drips in there. When you looked at him in the state, what was your thoughts? You know what? If you if you probe me on that, I'm gonna cry <laughs> because fine. it was the most That's painful. Uh, I personally think that as a mother, you express those feelings and you feel it, and and I feel it with you, and it's a very real feeling to understand all of that. You have no idea what goes through your mind. You look at this child with the infections, infection levels continuously. We were taught by one of the pediatricians there, and I'm sure she won't mind me refer, uh, mentioning her name, Hiri van der Watt. A fantastic, fantastic individual. She was so proactive from the time she came on. She was the one who actually diagnosed him. And hey, as a pediatrician, things this are more difficult. What, what they found, um, we were grasping at straws. His infection levels weren't coming down, they were fluctuating. He wasn't responding to any of the antibiotics and we had the really painful talk the following Saturday after the operation that he wasn't going to make it. Um, so they approached you and said that, that this is the real possibility. He wasn't going to make it. They brought in a ventilator into the room and they were prepared to resuscitate him if he, uh, if he crashed. Um, we never slept that night. The hospital... So, uh, what was your husband saying at this point? You know, I think at that point, if anything might have happened to our baby, yeah. I don't think he would have coped. Yeah. It was the first time I ever saw him break down from the time he was, you know, keeping his strength up for me. Um, 
and I think it was just a bit too much for him. It's his first child, and um, it was just a nightmare for us both. And eventually, we just held each other uh, in in a private ward, which they arranged for us. And we just had a major meltdown, and we resiled ourselves to the fact that we were going to lose him, yeah. and that we were could we were not going to blame each other because that often happens. Um, you know, you look for uh, reasons to blame the other, and it was actually nobody's fault. It was a freak occurrence. We were still trying to so understand. Your mind tells you that somebody yes. needs to take responsibility, and, and if you can't find who, it, who needs to take responsibility, the you next person that comes in front of you yes. is going to take responsibility. And unfortunately, you know, there's a saying in psychology that yes. you often lash out on those that you are closest to. Correct. And we spoke about it that night, and we said that no matter what happens, we were going to be there for each other, and we were not going to blame uh, one another for whatever was going to happen and it just so happened that miraculously he pulled through the night and we so were you in the hospital expecting yes. that tomorrow morning we might have a funeral in there every single time we heard a noise in the corridor we thought this was it they were coming That's to tell us idea. that he was he was dead because that is what they told us the day before. What goes through your mind to do something? I, I, I must be honest with you. I don't have any children. My view is I don't have children. I'm very candid about it. I do have pets, though. You have a uh, flurry of emotions. And, and even if there's something wrong with my pets, it's like mm. the world feels like it's crashing down. You have a flurry of emotions. You are completely distraught. You become withdrawn. You don't want to speak to anyone. You don't want to. Um, you you don't have an appetite. You did, can't did, eat. Did you, you become physically thing? and you become mentally drained. Did you think at that point that did something in the back of your mind tell you that you know what? If it's gone, it's fine. But but let it just let it be either way. But the no. anticipation inside all of that. No. Isn't that killing? No. I never once accepted. Uh, that he, w he was going to die. I just was angry. You know, people would say that this is blasphemous, but it's a natural human emotion that you experience. That's fine. You feel that you feel let down by your creator. You feel, why on earth must an innocent baby suffer so much? Um, and never once was I prepared to accept that he should die. I didn't want that at all. And I just felt that, you know, if people could pull through cancer, then there's hope for him. And I just kept myself going with that thought. Um, I must admit, I wasn't at my best uh, in those first two weeks. I was completely, completely broken. Um, I couldn't accept what was going on, and I refused to accept what was going on. Um, I began then to, uh, we changed pediatricians, and I think that was the best decision uh, that we uh, made. From your spouse and your husband, mm. uh, what was the support structure around you in terms of uh, extended family and friends? I don't have my side of the family living uh, in Cape Town because my family is from Durban, I'm from, from Durban, so I had quite a lot of support from colleagues, from my husband's family, who were phenomenal. Um, they were there for me at every step of the way, um, you know, re rendering messages, uh, uh, starting uh, prayers for the child. And, you know, at the same time, you don't want to be crowded with too many people because what happens is a lot of people ask repetitive questions and um, you don't normally, always have all the answers. The this is normally the case in any situation. Mm -hmm. a, a traumatic experience happens, mm -hmm. or there's a trauma going on. The, someone walk in the room and ask you the same question. Five yes. minutes later, in the end of the day, I think sometimes one can become frustrated, but you try to put that in retrospect that yes. they, I suppose they're concerned. And so uh, you sort of just yes. turned out on that. But in the end of the day, it can become taxing on you. Shama, you become tired of platitudes, let me tell you. You become tired of platitudes, you become tired of um, insane, insensitive questions that people come and ask you. And people actually tell you, you know, no matter what happens, if he dies, you must just accept it. Mm. 
and that's your child. I'm sorry, I am not one to sit back and accept anything that's thrown at me. I'm unfortunately not built that way. Um, and, and, so and, I'll, and I'll tell you, that's fine. The biggest thing that irritates me when I go anywhere is when somebody sees a grief-stricken person and says, yes. oh, you know what, you just need to accept it. At that time of the heightened sense of grief, Mm -hmm. That level of comprehension doesn't happen where you can tell someone it's rather best to sit back and say nothing exactly. than to say, no, you must just accept it. It doesn't make sense to that person. There are emotions of anger, yes. there's emotions of, 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 of despair, emotions of not knowing where you are. Unfortunately, you know what I learned is that you can't hold people's tongues. And unfortunately, people feel obligated I don't know why they feel this, but they feel obligated to say something to you. Um, and they need to realize when you approach a, 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 ch a parent with a sick child, you don't always have to say something. Just if you don't Show have anything. Mm. I always tell people, all you do, and this I do when I go to funerals, mm. I always leave my business card and I say, if there's anything you need, give me a call. But there's, no, there's nothing else to say at this point. There's nothing else that there's you can actually to say, say to anyone. Yeah. But this is why I say, you know, uh, I appreciate people giving me support, but if you don't have anything constructive to say, rather not say anything, stay away. Um, and that's one of the uh, advice uh, that I can give to people. Sure. When you approach a mother, especially, who has a really sick child, don't feel obligated to say anything because no matter what anyone says to me, I don't take comfort in it. Correct. Uh, Sh Shama, we're gonna, um, I'm going to end the show right here. Mm. Uh, I'm going to have you back on the next episode uh, mm. of the show because I think that there's a lot that we need to talk about. I think yes. we have just started mm. unpacking the reality of what's happening there. Shama Sheikh, she's talking about her son Ayan. He is six months at this point, uh, has um, some complications regarding his immune system. We're talking about her journey as a mother. We are going to talk in the next episode about some of her findings regarding this particular uh, ailment and how uh, you, having a similar problem at home, can support your child and then on the flip side knowing parents that has this particular problem what to do and not to do to support them until tomorrow thank you